I spent my entire religious life immersed in the Bible. I grew up memorizing verses and Bible stories before eventually going on to teach Sunday school classes, lead Bible studies, and work as the principal of a Christian school. I was even a statewide Bible quiz champion in high school. You'd think I would have come out of this knowing the Bible pretty well. But when I went back later and read the whole thing cover to cover in its entire context, I was shocked to discover how little of the Bible I'd actually known about. So to remedy this situation for other Christians, I've come up with a series of brief lessons designed to help clarify parts of the Bible they tend to ignore or reinvent. I'll start with a question, then we'll discuss the answer. Feel free to pause and think about your answer, without cheating, before we move on. For our first question, we'll start near the beginning of the Bible. According to Genesis 3, why did God kick Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden? If you said it was because they had tainted themselves and humanity by bringing original sin into the world, thus necessitating the later sacrifice of Jesus to remedy the situation several thousand years later, you would be wrong. In fact, you'd be wrong to say it had anything to do with his righteous anger over sin at all. Instead, God, or the gods, because in this passage like many others, it sounds like Jehovah is speaking to a pantheon of fellow deities, removed Adam and Eve from Eden because he was afraid that, if they stayed there, they might eat from the tree of life and thus gain immortality. They had already become like gods and that they'd obtain knowledge of good and evil, and Genesis insinuates that by then seizing eternal life, they would be taking another major step to becoming divine and challenging the supremacy of the gods. Thus his decision, as described in Genesis 3, was not a divine judgment of sin as much as a practical measure designed to prevent humans from becoming too powerful. But of course this brings up a host of questions in light of modern Christian theology. If God is the author and creator of everything, and he's ultimately in control, would not he and he alone determine who does and does not have eternal life? Would it really make sense that a piece of fruit could be imbued with supernatural powers that operate independently of God's decision-making process and could grant immortality against his will? And even if that were the case, why would an all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present God be concerned about removing them from the garden before they took the fruit? Was there a real danger that they might take it while he wasn't looking? Why? Couldn't he stop them at any time up to the moment that they were about to bite into the fruit? And shouldn't he be able to countermand the effects of the fruit by a simple act of his will anyway? Now there's a lot of room for interpretation in Genesis, so I know people can argue the details of my explanation. But a straight reading of this story should make it plainly obvious that this is a tale of a limited God concerned about how humans might maneuver against him through the use of magic objects. If Genesis were actually about a perfect, transcendent God concerned over deep spiritual problems of sin and the fall of his creation, wouldn't Genesis explicitly say so instead of relying on Christians to retroactively read this interpretation into the story thousands of years later? In any event, it's clear that Genesis does not say what you were probably taught it says about the fall of man. This has been today's Remedial Bible Lesson with Prophet of Zod. Please join us next time when we talk about the dangerous holiness that shoots out of God's face. And if you have any other ideas for Bible topics you'd like to see me cover, please let me know in the comments section below.